So um, I'll get started today. Um, last time we began. Last time. Last time we began our discussion of uh, a discrete event modeling, um, also called network modeling, process centric modeling, and uh, patient flow modeling, as it might be another informal term to describe it. Maybe you could remind us what were some of the same features, the distinguishing features of this sort of modeling? What were some of the, the major issues that come into play with this sort of model? Resource availability, good. And if there's no resources, what is the consequence? Okay, you might get deadlocked if you're not careful, if resources are not available. Uh, you could have one party that takes one resource, another party that takes another resource, and she's waiting for the resource of the other, something along those lines. But in general, as people are coming into the system, there's not enough resources available. What builds up? A queue. A queue will build up. And it can build up in various places in the system, depending where the resources are needed. So we have processes. We have these things that are called what that flow through the system that are being subjected to those processes. What do we what do we call those those parties that flow through the system? Entities. And in order to undergo a process, the entity commonly requires resources. And those resources uh, when available allow the, the entity to go through that process. If they're not available, the entity gets in a queue to await the availability of those resources. We further distinguish, we, we gave a, an overview last time of a, of a set of operators that any logic uses to logically describe the flow of these systems. So there were operators associated with what is called seizing or releasing a resource. And what did that what was involved with that? What was the sort of nature of seizing a resource? Who can remind me? In what, say, in what sense do we say uh, an entity has seized a resource? Okay. Okay, so that, an element of that resource is reserved for that entity until the point where it does what with that resource? It releases it, right. Okay, um, and those resources, uh, Dylan, you mentioned that it goes to a collection. What do we term that collection? It's a resource pool. And the reason I emphasize that is because the resources within that pool are considered interchangeable. They're sort of considered anonymous, well mixed, and you could draw any resource from the pool for you, for you, any resource unit from this pool. So there might be a pool of doctors, a pool of scopes, a pool of nurses, a um, pool of rooms. Now those resources that I've just listed come in various sorts. What were the three major sorts of resources we saw? There are three sort of categories of those resources that we delineated. What were those three categories? Good. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. Static or, or fixed. Uh, might use those synonymously. So, help you understand the distinction between portable and mobile. Portable resource, yes, it needs to be carried. To, to, it can move, 
but it can't move on its own agency. It can't move on its own, on its own accord. It needs to be to be carried, and it could be it could accompany what sort of resource? A mobile resource. It turns out it can also accompany a patient. So a patient might be in a wheelchair, and it can move along with the, with the wheelchair and move the, the um, energy expended by the patient. So you, you can have that, but the point is it needs to be accompanied. It can't just go on its own. You can't tell the scope in some disembodied way, you know, scope, go to Steve and you know, sort of make its way over there. Okay. Um, these are the three major sorts of, of resources, types of resources. And um, we saw that in addition to reserving resources associated with an entity, we could attach them and detach them from the entity. And that had to do with the question about whether they travel with the entity or not. So a portable resource can be attached to the entity, a moving resource can be attached to the entity, and then when wherever the entity goes, there goes this resource. Right? That was attachment, detachment. We saw that. Oh, question. Um, yes. So a uh, question here. Um, Oh, oh gosh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I thought that had been enabled. Uh, I appreciate you, um, you enabling. Can you uh, hear me now? Good, okay, okay. Well, we've just been rehearsing the contents uh, from yesterday. Um, apologies you missed that. But we've gone over um, some of the basic notions here associated with discrete event modeling entities flowing through processes that operate and the availability of to undergo a given process is dictated by resources and three major sorts of resources, portable, fixed, and, and uh, or static and, and moving. Um, static and moving being, oh, excuse me, static and fixed being sort of synonyms. We've talked about um, uh, certain types of operators available, uh, attachment, detachment, for having an entity move with resources, either moving or portable. And we've talked about operators for reserving those resources associated with seizing and releasing. Um, we have noted that these resources come in pools of interchangeable resources um, within a pool. And uh, when a pool is exhausted and an agent wants to seize one of those resources, a queue will build up or they'll await that resource, and there's a risk of that walk. So that, in a nutshell, is, is kind of what we've been discussing here. Um, and uh, we're going to be turning for today's lecture to um, a visual representation. So last time, we, we concentrated largely on how the, um, the system logically dealt with these issues and how we could sketch that out within a, a flow diagram using these operators. I alluded to, but I didn't, um, I didn't actually show uh, in detail the fact that uh, these various types of resources and entities could be associated with visual representations. Um, whoo, okay, I just started application sharing, but now it's quit. Okay, I'm, um, I'm, uh, encountering uh, discomfort. Um, okay, somehow application sharing started and stopped, so let's try this again. Um, we're going to share, first of all, our um, PowerPoint window here. Okay, looks like we're happy campers now. So um, we're going to be going over the visual representation part. So within, uh, within discrete event modeling and any logic, um, accompanying this logical flow that we talked about last time, these, these operators, is a flow that, that has implications for visual depiction or, or appearance. So very much part of this whole process-centric modeling, uh, network-oriented modeling, is a, uh, a visual language associated with it or, or visual depictions that illustrate it. So entities are going to be associated with icons. The icons for the entity may change under different circumstances. Uh, resources are associated with locations as well as icons. 
and movement networks are associated with routing paths. So we can have an entity and the resources associated with that entity routed among a variety of paths as illustrated through polylines in any logic. And any logic will take care of routing uh, a given individual from point A to point B through this network of lines. Um, and uh, we can further delineate home locations, for example, associated with resources using polylines as well. Um, so um, we're going to, to see how this, is, um, this plays out. Can you folks remotely see, um, see the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, display? For some reason, this is scrolling up. Um, no, you can't. OK. OK, it's showing a, a yellow, um, a yellow uh, border around the screen. Um, we're going to do take two on this. So I'm going to stop the sharing. And I'm actually, this is take three, isn't it? Um, OK, uh, I'm going to try it again. So here we go. Um, OK, it, it indicated before that it was sharing the application. Now it said that again. Can you now see my PowerPoint screen? OK, still a gray window. OK. Um, <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, I, I'm in uh, Sphinx uh, S386, like the microprocessor, S386, uh, and, and uh, Sphinx Thorvaldson edition, Tyson. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, try one more time here, and, uh, and perhaps, the, perhaps this will work. Uh, no, please do. Uh, I'd be very happy if the cavalry were coming. Um, okay, so uh, once again, I have a a nice uh, yellow border around. And once again, I will pose the question to the uh, remote audience. Do you see the PowerPoints um, on the screen here? Is, is there any? Uh, OK. <laughs> OK. This, this, is, uh, this is a, uh, a dis, displeasing uh, event. OK. So I'm going to start once again. Um, and uh, I think what I'll do is is go and share the entire desktop this time. Let's give it a, give it a try that, that way. OK, now I'm sharing the desktop. Do you see me now? Uh, th there it is. OK, grand success. Um, I am unsettled as a scientist for flailing, um, by flailing. But sometimes flailing uh, is the only recourse. Fortunately, the cavalry is coming. Uh, OK, so here we can associate, for example, networks with paths. So let's go, let's go take a look within this model we were working with last time, the ophthalmology department, which I sent to all of you. And uh, if we go to the ophthalmology department, um, you should uh, see in, in main phase one, two, or three for any of them, uh, but I'm looking here at main phase three, if you go click on this thing that says network, it, um, it's down here in the lower part of the screen. And you'll notice it says that there's a group of network shapes called network group here. Okay? Um, and uh, this network group is referring to a group that's specified uh, over under main phase three. So um, for those of you who are in any logic right now and you open main phase three, if you navigate over in your projects window, under main phase three, and sort of click on the, the, plus, uh, the plus sign associated with projects, it will expand it. And if you open the presentation component, you'll see there's something called network group. And network group basically delineates a set of resources visually uh, within, the, uh, within this canvas here. And you'll see them uh, selected here. Because of our remote uh, people, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that you're not seeing what I'm seeing right now. But basically, I've clicked on Network Group in Main Phase 3, clicking on it in the Projects window, and it's selected all the items in that group. That group has grouped together a whole bunch of visual elements that would normally be distinct, like the waiting hall, the staff room, the storage room, the proc room, one, two, three. Can you folks remotely see this? Um, can you, can you see my AnyLogic uh, window as I'm moving around in it as well? Okay, good. 
So uh, here's this network group. And you'll notice that a bunch of them are actually named. So here's procedure room 1, 1 and 2, for example. Um, this is procedure room 3 later. And this is the waiting hall. So each of those is given a name. And these names are important. Where might these names be used? Where might we use those names? We actually saw a glimpse of them last time. Does anyone remember where we saw waiting hall, for example? Well, if we go look at source, what you'll see is that here individuals uh, within this are going to uh, appear. Excuse me, it's under network enter. It's not source. Excuse me, it's under network enter. So when they enter that network, they appear in the waiting hall. Okay. So that individual is going to pop into existence in this waiting hall. And visually, that's where you'll see them uh, start up. And because I have my remote folks on sharing the entire desktop, I have the luxury here of, of running this um, to actually see this application in action. And what you'll see is that these individuals, when they come in, they go into the waiting hall, this room up here. So. We've just had one, one, ah, there, there we go. So they appeared up in this waiting hall at a random location. Um, so uh, that is one way in which we have a association of a network with a network uh, group, a whole set of presentation elements. And then because it knows about those presentation elements, because the network knows about everything in, in that network group, um, this group here, uh, we can refer to that within things like this network enter here. Um, okay, so uh, that's that's an example of, of how we tell it about information. Okay, um, so here's the network group. Um, okay, um, another thing will be associated, another type of visual information will be associated with the source. So if you go up to the source, um, the source will indicate the uh, the sort of icon that could, should be used for a given entity. Specifically, if you look on, it should be under the general properties, I believe, um, uh, it should say entity animation shape. And we, could, we can dictate um, what shape we want to use. So in this case, we've picked randomly among two possible shapes, patient and shape patient. Um, entity animation shape. So this is a bunch of a bit of Java code that lets you pick a patient. And to be clear, this could be a method call which executes a bunch of call, a bunch of, of other code to pick a patient in a very sophisticated way. Maybe it colors them according to their state or what have you. But this is how we set the shape associated with the patient. Um, we can sh uh, we can request a unique shape for each entity, for example, and we can enable rotation, etc. Um, Similarly, when we have a resource, if we go select that resource um, down here, let's, let's try it here. Um, we select doctor, for example. What you'll see is that there's a delineation of the resource associated with that, uh, uh, the visual representation associated with the resource. So here, there's two types. There's an idle one and there's a busy <coughs> one. Um, and uh, here we have shape doctor when it's idle and doctor one as it's busy. Um, to, to add a little bit of, of um, texture to this presentation, I'd like to actually change one of these. Um, so for main phase three, I'd like to suggest that we give a doctor a, um, uh, a different representation. Um, specifically, what I'd like to suggest is that we we connote the very active um, life that doctors live using uh, a, a, a fighter jet. Okay, um, so uh, you'll notice that that place down here at the bottom. There's actually a, a fighter jet, and um, if we were to substitute that in for the busy unit, um, we should be able to to lend them a different appearance. So I'm going to switch over here. So was there a question here? Did I hear a, a ding? Maybe not. OK. So um, if we run this now, what we'll see is we've changed the appearance of doctors so that when they are in a busy state, they change into a fighter jet. 
They are initially not fighter jets, but but sort of like Superman, they morph appearance um, when when they become busy. So uh, here we have an illustration of of icons and presentations associated with with resources. Now we'll see that the um, uh, right. I think I think I'm going to um, leave that for now. We'll come back to something. Um, okay, so uh, if we go to the resource, we'll see that not only do we specify uh, shapes associated with the resource, but there's uh, a home node associated with the resource as well. Um, and this node is, uh, in this case, it's a single node. That's a single point um, or single uh, region, and it's called the staff room. Uh, so that's that's where, for example, they go back to after they see a patient. That's how they know to go back to that point by going back to that staff room. Okay. Um, so uh, when they enter the network, uh, they do appear in a waiting hall, and they have a certain speed associated with them. Um, and this speed is going to be used to dictate how quickly they move around the facility. So. Um, the speed is going to be some number of, of um, pixels, I believe, per unit time, um, so per, per unit of virtual time within the model. So right now it's a speed of, of 10, and that's associated with the speed of entities. If we go and we looked at, at uh, doctors um, as, as a resource, what we'd see is that doctors move with the speed dictated by their, um, by their uh, status. So here they're given a speed of 1,000, which perhaps is more appropriate for a fighter jet than for a person. Um, so uh, if we were to tune this down to, say, 5, so make them move at a more stately pace, and now when we run this model, what we'd see is that doctors uh, don't proceed nearly as, as quickly as patients. So here's a, a fighter jet just leaving its, um, leaving its hangar and proceeding to the patient. Now, this speed is important because speed can be one of the causes, can contribute to bottlenecks. Because there may be bottlenecks in terms of movement through the facility. The fact that two places are far apart may lead to real, um, real uh, bottlenecks in terms of processing patients. So much time is being spent getting from A to B that you're just not able to to uh, handle the volume of patients. And here, the amount of time spent moving overall is an emergent property. It emerges from the placement of the locations they have to go to, the rules for when they have to go to them, the speed with which they move. But it's a, it's a suggestion of one of the powers of, the, of this methodology that we can actually study the impact of things like layout and the rules for under what conditions you go to what, what places using this, um, using this approach. So here we have speed as a very important parameter and the amount of time they take to go from point A to point B will be a function moreover of the paths, okay? So uh, the paths that, uh, over which they can travel. So let's, let's talk about these paths over which they can travel. And in fact, if we were to look at this, and I think I'm gonna speed this up, you'll notice, wow, that that fighter jet sure moves fast after it's picked up the patient. Um, so th this is moving it. Watch, watch the path of that. You'll notice that it goes up in this kind of odd path. Um, I don't know if you, you were able to catch that. But um, come on in, Tyson. And thanks, thanks very much for your help. There's some extra seats up here uh, as well. So um, here we have different paths, and you may be asking, why are we traveling over these paths in this sort of way? Thanks for coming over. Really appreciate that. Um, so in order to figure out where those paths are coming from, why they're traveling on them, what we have to do is go look at the, the model definition. So I'm going to stop this depiction, and we're going to go over and click on the model here um, and, and call the model up. Um, so you folks remotely are still following along with this um, uh, with this full screen share, is that right? Okay. 
That was something that didn't work earlier, but, but seems to have worked um, work now. Okay, so if we go to main phase three here, what we'll see is that with our model, there's a network of paths. And in fact, the, the kind of odd movement we saw, the movement that kind of went up and then back down, was a function of this path. So if we were to kind of make that look more reasonable, and then we were to rerun this model, uh, we would then we would then see a more a more regular form of movement. Um, so let's let's try this. Okay, so we're now going to see as as the uh, people accumulate here. Um, you, you you notice that these um, uh, these movement paths to this far location here are now going along these new paths we've delineated. So this network of lines that may appear kind of a, an odd an odd visual artifact is actually a, um, uh, a, a significant, um, meaningful um, sort of computational specification of the paths by which entities can move. What's more significant here is, is the fact that any logic behind the scenes is doing the calculations to route people. So um, you folks may, may remember last time that um, when we uh, move people around the facility, we actually did so. We concentrated on the logic of it, but we did so with certain operators. So um, there was this sent to storage operator, which sent a doctor to storage to retrieve a scope. And then there was a, a send to patient operator, whereby that doctor, together with the scope, was sent to the patient. And you may remember the essence of how that was specified. So if we go to send to patient, we look at that operator right now, what we'll see is that it sends, says send the doctor and scope to the entity. That's, that's what's specified here. So it de says destination is entity. But you could specify a specified node as the destination, you know, that you go to, to a certain location and specify the name of a node, or that you go to a seized resource unit. I want to emphasize again something I, I did last time, which is the doctor and scope here specifically referring to the resources associated with this agent. Okay. Um, so in other words, uh, these are resources associated, excuse me, this entity. These are the resources that have been reserved for a given entity. And the fact that we've reached this point within this flow over time it's associated with an entity. It's the entities which are flowing down these lines here. And this entity has associated with them a doctor and a scope. And those are the resources being mobilized now to be sent to, the, to that particular entity, that particular patient in this case. So it's important when you think about the semantics of this to realize that we are executing the send to patient for a particular entity. And that gives meaning when we say doctor and scope. It's not just any old doctor. It's the doctor associated with this entity. Okay. Um, okay. So this send to patient routed the doctor and scope to the entity from wherever they currently are. Now, wherever they currently are is that storage. How did it know to do that? Well, that was handled behind the scenes by any logic, knowing that if they're here to get over to where the patient is, the patient's over in the waiting room still, they need to go via this route here. So it, it figures out how to get from A to B. Okay, okay that's a good question. And uh, off have I wondered about that, and off have I, have I regretted not having had the time to, to investigate it. So let's go investigate it right now. Is that going to make um, uh, it's a good question. Um, my guess is we'll do the shortest path. Um, uh, use a, it probably uses the shortest path algorithm to figure it out. But let's see if we can do that. Heck, um, it, sh it shouldn't be too hard. So let's go over to this, um, uh, to this model right now. And uh, what I'm going to do is to um, uh, go and we're going to have to look at main phase three, the visual representation of this. Um, and you'll notice how these are composed. So right now, this is actually composed of a, of a whole bunch of things conglomerated together. And we're going to have to add a component to it. Okay? 
we're going to have to add an element into this. So um, I'm, I'm working close to the edge here because I've never done this before, but uh, let's, let's actually try uh, ungrouping, um, ungrouping this thing. So, um, uh, well, excuse me, all we have to do is, is add something in here, but we, what we will have to do is to, um, uh, to, to sort of join, join these things in, in a new fashion, okay? Um, join these elements together. So, um, specifically this element here, rectangle four, joins several, several lines, and then this element here also joins several lines. So let's create another rectangle. Maybe we can, uh, for example, copy and uh, paste here, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a junction. I'm, I'm going to drag this here. Um, uh, okay, I think we have to be a bit careful here. Um, because I think we need to end. Let me let me just uh, check on this. I think we may need to end. Yes, we have to have it be at the terminal axis of a given um, a given point. So we might be able to add a polyline in, for example, from here all the way routed around to this point. Okay, I think I think that would that would address Jin's question, right? So so let's go down to presentation. And and see if we could um, add this in. So here's a uh, here's a line. We don't want a line. We want a polyline. So what we want to do is um, I think we want to extend one from this point, from this point on this uh, over to to this point. Something like something like that, I think. Um, and we'll see if we can get this thing to work. Um, if not, I may have to study it offline. Okay, so maybe we could do something like this. Um, so they would travel along here rather than going all the way down, down to here. Does that does that look um, look feasible? Okay, so all I've done is I've copied this rectangle, put it at the end of two polylines. I I, I had a polyline, a new polyline like that, and put it at the end of this other this other point. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's give this uh, give this thing a shot and see if it recognizes this. Um, whoop, okay. Um, so I'm going to try running this. If anyone's ahead of me and, and can can warn me if I've done something silly. Oh, look at that! So now it's it's showing up. But let's let's go see. Let's speed this thing up. Okay. So the jet fighters have come out and. They are still going the the old route. Uh, that okay? Yes, you're correct. Um, you're ah yes, you're right about that. So, so in other words, you're saying this thing is going to the waiting room. I shouldn't actually have a square there. I don't actually need a square there. Uh, I was thinking that I needed that to join them, but no, you're right about that. Um, because there's already a rectangle there. The rectangles are kind of the the boundary points. Okay, so let's let's try it now. So Jen had pointed out that I don't need that rectangle there. Okay, so uh, still going via the old route down, not the new route. Um, so let's uh, let's see if we could futz with this a bit more. See if we can get that. So there's two hypotheses I have. One is that it's not actually trying to route it. It doesn't recognize that as a legitimate routing path, number one. Number two, I have a hypothesis that maybe it's just using an algorithm which doesn't compute the shortest path. It just you know, uses an arbitrary path. And I'm not sure which it is. Okay, so you'll notice, the other sorry? Just delete, delete one of the other okay, that's a good idea, to test it. Yeah, let's let's try that. So it's something like, oh, not that well, one. We might want to not not that one. Still <laughs> yes. Like yeah, it, yes, that. exactly. Um, so uh, do 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 do. Um, so we probably want to pull this thing. Oh, okay. Uh, now this is like a backbone link, so that one's hard to disrupt. Um, uh, okay, what would be the sort of most parsimonious? 
way to do it. Well, okay, here's, a, here's another idea. Instead of connecting those two, I could connect these two and I could eliminate this, this link here, right? Something like that. Um, and so he can go directly from what this to this, right? That that should work. Um, so we we've got another issue that's more minor issue that we're still dealing with, which which is why this shows up still, um, and and we'll get to that. But okay, so so now we have these things coming along. The the doctors are serving the patients. Um, ooh, look at that, unreachable from. So it's not actually recognizing that as a legitimate route. Oh, why not? Well, I did something crazy. This needs to be copied into there. Sorry. Um, you're going to need to copy it into, sorry, I toned out there, into the network group. Boom. Okay. Okay, now I think we're cooking with gas. Um, so, okay, so I just, I just dragged and dropped it into this network group. Um, I just, you know, dragged it up, uh, Dylan, I dragged it up onto this thing and, and it's that's, that's under presentation and under main phase three. Okay, let me let me just do it. Is it joined to the network? No, th yeah, okay, she, she got it just before, um, before I did here. Um, so, uh, so we need to, we need to get this thing connecting the right points here too. Uh, for some reason it displaced it, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it has to go in the network, so it has to know know about it. Okay, so it has to be part of that network. Okay, so now let's let's run this thing, and uh, and we should be able to see this. Um, so try this now. Okay, you notice it's not appearing um, at this point. So it's it's as a member of that network, it's it knows that it's not appearing. Okay, now now we have. Okay, there we go. Um, you'll notice it's traveling on that um, on this alternative path. Let's let's try this again. Um, so let's let's slow this down, get it in slow mo, um, and see if it's going to go via that new route rather than the uh, yes. Well, that's the only route it can go. So now let's add that that extra one back in that used to be there, right? Um, so let's add, or better yet, let's just create create a new one. So we add a new polyline, and this is called polyline three. Should really have a better name for it. Um, I'll drag it to the network group, drag it in there. Okay, so now we have polyline three here, and where is it? It's located off there. Okay, so let's drag this up. Come on, uh, we're gonna drag it up here, and we will try to create an alternative path. So this guy, okay, this, this is a little bit, a um, uh, little bit awkward. I'm gonna drag this guy so he doesn't go there and drag this one. So if you double click on these little lines, you can, you can get rid of them. If you double click on the line itself, you can add a little, um, ooh, Excuse me. You can add you can add one of these sort of little nubs as well, um, and that will allow you to sort of drag it in a in a different form. So, Jen, I have now added this. I'm going to drag it way up that like that to answer your question, right? So now I've got two paths from whoa, from this procedure room three to the wa waiting hall, right? Let's see which it takes. Okay. Um, and let's let's run this thing. So again, I, I added that into the presentation group. Okay. Okay. So the suspense builds. Okay. So there's presentation room one. Okay. So it seems to have done it via the. Oh. Uh, okay. It's taking a different path that time, right? So maybe it's non-deterministic. Maybe sometimes it takes one, sometimes it takes the other. Um, so let, let's see, let's test it, okay. Uh, so let's see where how it goes there this next time. So 
Okay, a uh, question coming in. Yes. Uh, oops. Where, where is it? Hey. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> okay. I still see you in there, so. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's just. Uh, okay. Okay, it's shorter to get back to the store that way. Okay. So that's interesting. Um, okay. So that there it goes in that normal way. I, I guess Neil is saying it's it's shorter to go up this way to get back to the store. Oh yeah. Okay. I, 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 I make the second one I was long. So this one here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see what Neil's saying. That that actually it makes sense that it's going back the, to the store because that's faster than going through this, right? Um, uh, yeah, so that that actually does make sense. Okay. Uh, well, no, you could go up like this and then like like that. Um, uh, sure. So we could um, we could try to make this a very convoluted path. You're saying, Jen? S something. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, here, let's let's try this again. Um, I'm trying to, any logic's a bit tricky. Okay, probably, oh, okay, there we go. That's what I was looking for. Okay, um, so something like this. Um, and then I'll, I'll put another one of these handles in it. Hey, come on. Okay. Um, and going up like this, Jen? Something like that? <laughs> What's that? It's going to be funny when the algorithm only considers endpoints as polylines. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, if that's the case, then. Okay. So, so something along these lines, Jen? Is that uh, sufficiently convoluted? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and more to the point, to make it no longer the shortest path. So it will actually be better to go here and down around, right? Let's put in one more for good measure. Um, okay, uh, there we go. Okay, so this is the accordion, the accordion path, right? Let's let's stop this. We got to run it again because it's not going to take into account those changes until we we rebuild it. In fact, um, okay. So here we go. How many think we will go via the accordion path? Okay, uh, yes, indeed, the intelligence of any logic is impressive. Um, so, so now it, it decided not to go the accordion path. Um, it's, it's going back via the shortest route, it looks like. Um, that was a rather convoluted way to demonstrate that, but um, it seems to have convincingly demonstrated. So they're going back this way, coming back around, just to return the scope. It's going all the way back to this room uh, here because the way back directly from this procedure room three is just too convoluted, right? Okay, look at that. Um, an entity was not able to leave this port. Consider increasing capabilities of the subsequent object. So one of these things exceeded, aha, look, it circled which ones, network enter. It was unable to enter this port, um, and I think it was probably because it exceeded the capacity of the either the waiting room or entering this network C's. Um, uh, oh, I see. Yeah, network C's filled up as a hundred. So let's go up, see why that was. Why did we get that? Why did we get that error message? Um, if we go to network C's, what we'll find is that that the capacity of this is 100. So it was unable to leave that preceding node, network enter, to come here because network cease was full, so it threw up an exception. Now, if we wanted to allow it to leave on some timeout, we could, we could check this box and have people balk. In other words, have people leave, say, after, if they haven't gotten service after time 50, you know, 50 time units waiting, they leave the system. Um, okay, so uh, we could do that. We 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 won't. But um, 
I hope this is bringing home for you the fact that that uh, speed is important, path, um, you know, path, the geometry is important, and the rules governing movement under what conditions they're sent to storage, sending to patient, etc. Um, these things are all important for as as uh, sh as far as shaping the throughput of the system, how many people you treat per unit time, how many patients you can treat per hour, or something along those lines. And that's what really recommends this sort of modeling. If you're interested in, in knowing why your emergency room is so slow in you know, delivering care when patients arrive, or if you want to understand why it is that um, you know, in, in this uh, nursing care facility that meals take two hours to deliver throughout the facility, you might use a sort of modeling like this. And it could capture the impact of, say, using a different room for storage of, of certain items. So you might, for example, store the uh, scopes you know, closer to the uh, patient room, to the waiting room, so that when a doctor returns the scope, they can quickly go from there to the patient room to get the next patient. Or maybe they carry the scope with them instead of returning it. Those are the sort of things which you could look at within this context by using a different sort of a set of flow operators um, uh, to describe it, or a different set of locations on the screen. Um, look, let's look further into this, though. So we've seen these sort of polylines in pr maybe more detail than we'd like. Um, we've we've uh, experimented with adding polylines, and we've seen um, what Carmel anticipated, which is that polylines do need to be added in to this network group to be known by it. So if we want them to be considered, they have to be associated with this network, and this network is associated with the network group, so they have to be a member of this network group to be recognized, to have their names known as far as destination of routing paths, as far as home nodes for resources, and all those sort of good things. Okay, um, so um, recall that, that um, we have uh, room, we have resources, and these resources are associated with nodes. So we saw before when we had doctors, let, and let's just uh, go down here on our screen. When we had doctors, um, by the way, are, are, you, are you folks uh, still seeing my AnyLogic uh, screen here? Yep, okay, great, um, thanks. So if we have doctors here, um, you'll notice that these were given a home. Um, of the staff room. Um, now, um, I'm going to, by the way, switch in mine um, to, to help, um, help switch back so I don't forget later. I'm going to switch the busy shape back to oops, Dr. One from being uh, fighter jet. So for the home node of doctors, it's delineated as being the staff room here, it's specified here. Um, scopes. So what, what sort of resource is a doctor? So of those three sorts of, of resource categories, what is a doctor? It's a what sort of resource? It's a mobile resource. How about a scope? It's a portable resource. Um, and uh, we could, we could see that indicated up there. Portable resource, however, can have a home node, a storage room. And that's, that's relevant because when we go when we go back to uh, release the, the resources, um, there's a return scope. And this says, um, you know, destination is, and it, it actually, you could say home of seized resource. In this case, it actually sends it explicitly to the storage room, which is an alternative option. But uh, the point is that scopes have home nodes as well. They have nodes associated with them that, where they are stored, where they're, where they're uh, placed by default when they're not in use. Now, procedure rooms are a little bit different. You'll notice that for doctors, the home node, I should have shown this earlier, is a single node. You'll notice that it says home defined by single node. You'll notice for scopes, the home is defined by a single node. For a procedure room, by contrast, the, the home for it is defined by a path across nodes. And what is this home path? It's room's location, okay? 
Now, we could go up to room's location. You'll notice that room's location is uh, also located within this, um, within this main phase three. It's not a member of network group, but it is here. You'll notice room's location. So let's go, let's go select that. And you'll notice it, it indicates these three points. So where those little handles are here on the screen is an indication of the home locations for each successive room in that room resource pool. That's where it lives. It's the rectangles associated with that. Okay. Um, so it, or it's the shape on which this is, is led. I don't think it's uh, rectangles are particularly privileged in that regard. Okay, um, so this polyline defines locations associated with the, uh, with the procedure rooms. Okay, um, okay um, let's, uh, let's now um, uh, talk a little bit about um, a, a clearly delineated place like the exit. Uh, when we have move to exit, we can say, okay, move to, this is again, when we have, what's the difference, let's, let's go over this again to make sure you're comfortable with it. What's the difference between send to, network send to, and network move to? Who can remember that? We went over it last time. Network send to versus network move to. It has to do with who is being asked to move. We'll give you that hint. Network move to, who's being asked to move? It's the entity themselves. Network send to, it's uh, resources associated with the entity. Okay. So it might be a, a mobile resource is being asked to go to, to the entity, perhaps with a portable resource like a scope. Okay. So here we have move to exit. This is a, a move to, a network move to operator. And we say move to the specified node, the exit node. And exit, ag again, is a member of, of, um, of shared, a shared group, OK? Um, OK. A, a few comments on this. And uh, I'd like to talk now about, um, and then I'd like to go on to, to look at a, a hierarchical model. Um, OK. So uh, a really valuable tool when we do this sort of um, do this sort of comp uh, this sort of uh, modeling is is what's known as subclassing, um, and uh, subclassing um, is a technique to achieve um, achieve reuse of implementations of a class where you can create a new class that inherits the implementation of an old class, but can be customized in certain aspects. And subclassing occurs in conjunction in Java with subtyping. So the subclass can be passed around as if it were an instance of the superclass, OK? Um, so um, in this case, we're going to frequently use subclassing to customize agent entities and resources. For example, to carry around a different, uh, additional information, um, history information, or a reference to some external agent in an agent-based model, as we'll see in, a, in an example uh, later in the, in the, in the term. Um, and uh, we may further want to have information associated with resources. For example, um, the uh, fraction of the time a given resource was in use, et cetera. Um, so uh, we create a new class that's a subclass of a network resource pool, for example, or of an entity that will carry on, um, uh, carry through this additional information. Um, yeah, sure. I, I don't know if it's recording anymore because that exception may have had to do with recording. Um, so uh, if you'd like, I'd like to take advantage of your presence in seeing if we could recreate this problem that went on before. Sure, we're actually uh, getting some really bad audio. Is that right? Okay. Do you want do you want to do you want to take a look what's on my screen right now? And sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, wow, you folks are observant. Um, so, how do I re-enable recording here or check if it's currently re being recorded? Uh, just uh, flip back to um, whiteboard. Just a Is this the whiteboard here? Yeah. This guy here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, that must have been the exception. Um, okay, we're, started. we're we're testing it now. Now it's it's recording. Um, is the audio any better? No, this this uh, pardon me, folks, uh, for just a moment here, because this is a, a significant impact for our remote people. So, as I understand it, the audio is being streamed over to Edmonton and back. Is that right? Yeah, yeah it's being streamed to Illuminate. Talk has now been enabled. Um, okay. Test, 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 test. This is a bad audio level. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yank it up some. Um, the audio level now is. Okay, um, pardon me, because I, I further record this on, um, on uh, Camp, Camp Studio, Studio. yeah. Um, so, and this, Ooh. I'm wondering so if that's... This, this is the recording that they're yeah. seeing in Camp Asia, not the, so you haven't actually been recording with collaborating. I actually have collaborated, uh, collaborate recording, but it's, it's predominantly that's Camp Asia one that, that they can see. Yeah, yeah. So we're just, Sorry, we're just conferencing here. here. We're going to ask okay. Okay, so uh, what I would suggest is this. Why don't we pursue this further offline, but I'd like to try this thing with the, um, with the screen sharing. Like, why didn't that work, right, earlier? Okay, folks, um, pardon me, but I'm just going to uh, stop screen sharing here, and then I'm going to start sharing this um, uh, particular, um, particular application. Okay, now I'm, I'm sharing my... Um, my uh, my presentation here. Of course, now it's appearing. It is. Yeah. Okay. So I'm seeing that online now. If you actually go in, okay. So you have the show running in behind there, and or is that your that's your PowerPoint show? Right? That's my PowerPoint show. Yeah. Okay. So what's that thing now? I guess I just got to come to the classrooms. Um. Well, you'd be the most welcome. Um. <laughs> and uh, y y yeah, okay. Um, what I would suggest is this. Um, what, why don't I finish up a couple more slides here, and then I could let these folks go, and we could have at it. And 
Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. Um, uh, I'm also wondering if there's interference with Cam Studio or something. Um, I mean, is that is that possible that it's possible? I've never had anyone run Cam Studio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, finish up some some uh, extra uh, extra components here. So um, right. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my speakers are actually not not Um Okay, right. Um, so. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Man, okay. Thank you. Um, okay. How do I? Okay. There we go. That's good. So, uh, is it okay if I incline this sort? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, having having uh, looked at this, I think we're in um, uh, pretty good uh, pretty good stead in terms of specifying these different elements that are required for visual representation of the uh, of the components. Uh, suffice it to say, for each of Eddie's resources. Uh, the paths uh, pass through for routing. Um, we we have these uh, visual representations associated with them. There's quite a bit of latitude in setting those visual representations and even dynamically changing them, such as having different um, different icons associated with an end, uh, with a resource when it's busy and not busy, or associated with a with an incoming patient. Um, um, but those are the elements of discrete event modeling that I wanted to understand. Are there any questions on this before um, I speak a little bit about a separate topic? Yeah, question. Uh, you mentioned uh, Bigfoot. Take a look at a hybrid model, 
which brings together both agent-based and discrete event features and uh, use it to sort of illustrate uh, just how tightly these two can be, uh, can be coupled together. So if we were to go, and it's, you, you have it in, in your example models, um, a close uh, relative of this, but um, if we were to go to, and I'm going to have to navigate here for a second. Um, so models. And uh, oh shoot, okay. I think I'm gonna have to go. Okay, example models. Um, it's in a um, a thing called uh, hybrid uh, ABM network modeling one. Okay. Um, uh, here we have a uh, a model which uh, has both discrete event features and. Uh, agent-based features. So if we were to run this thing, um, what we would see is a population shown down here in the lower, lower part of the screen and a discrete event model up at the uh, upper part of the screen. This population down here is specified with uh, uh, in, a, in a classic agent-based fashion. So there's this population. Um, each agent is defined as we've seen it before as um, having susceptible in ill and death and for reasons that are shrouded in, in history um, each of these persons has a GPA as well which um, whose dynamics have nothing to do with, uh, with the state in which they're located but uh, they can proceed among these these different states and they're embedded within networks so they have a set of, of neighbors within this networks and a position in space um, However, on the upper part of this, of this um, system, what we have is a series of, of, uh, of processes that are described using a process flow language within any logic with which we're, we're familiar, which includes you know, a source entering this network, moving to a certain point, um, uh, seizing a doctor, getting treated, and either a, a, a positive or a negative outcome associated with the treatment that treatment outcome ends up impacting the evolution of that agent in terms of their health status. So in other words, um, if they're ill, they'll go uh, seek care. And if the, uh, if the procedure is, um, is successful, they'll return to a state of good health. If it's unsuccessful, they will die. Um, so these individuals here who are presented for care have done so because they've become ill. We don't have time to go into all the details of this, but suffice it to say that if we, if we were to go to look at this transition here, becoming ill within the actual model, what we'll see is that uh, within the state chart, becoming ill is associated with an um, is an event associated with a request to seek care. And uh, when they go to seek care uh, within, the main, within the main class here, um, there's a, a function uh, seeking care. And that function will take care of injecting that entity uh, into a queue where they're awaiting, uh, awaiting care. And, um, and then it tells this source node, hey, this person's awaiting care. The source node will in turn take them out of the queue. It will uh, <coughs> remove them from this, uh, this queue and inject them into the network in such a way that the entity remembers the associated agent. And when they then go and and are, have an outcome here of treatment um, with a certain probability they are, are, are cured and a certain probability there's a treatment failure. And if this were an entity and you had some associated entity and they were, say, cured, um, how would you tell the entity that they're to be cured? So if you, or sorry, tell the agent. So if you have an agent represented with a, whose health status is represented with a state chart, what would be a sort of way you might tell that agent you've been cured? You might do what to the agent? You might 
How do we have agents communicate with each other? Send a, send a message. So here, when you have this outcome of this, this procedure, um, it's going to call a method, if it's been successful, which delivers to the associated person with this entity something saying you've been cured. So these entities flow through. They're associated with an agent. And based on the outcome of the procedure, they are either cured or they, they have a treatment failure, in which case they die. So here, the entity status, the, the, the status, status of the agent associated with the entity will depend upon their, uh, the successful provision of, of, of treatment here. And then they subsequently get released. So within this model, um, what we have is this sort of uh, hybrid of, on the one hand, this, this agent-based modeling, where people are in networks and so on. On the other hand, there's this, this facility here. This is a very powerful combination because, among other things, in contrast to normal entities, once entities leave this system, they remember they have some, they, they could accumulate information on how they've been treated in the system in the past and past engagements, and that might affect their willingness to go back to that facility. Their, um, uh, it might affect their treatment in the future within that facility. So here we have a, a single model which brings together, on the one hand, agent-based modeling at an individual level. On the other hand, this sort of discrete event modeling, this process-centric modeling, again, at the individual level. Sure, please. And this, this uh, combination is particularly powerful because often agents are associated with processes, have to go through a set of, of steps associated with workflow, perhaps it's provision of healthcare, maybe it's uh, contact tracing, maybe it's um, uh, associated with, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's try that again. Um, uh, so uh, it may be associated with uh, contact tracing, it may be associated with uh, some sort of processing, associated with legal status, say citizenship or what have you. You could have these entities going through a set of processes. And rather than trying to, to describe all these processes within the agent, within state charts associated with the agent, we, we instead can describe them using this language associated with, with um, processes, this language well, well suited to describing flows and resources, et cetera. This is a very powerful combination illustrating any logic's ability to combine multiple sorts of modeling. So is this displaying right now, then? Yeah. It, it on, on, screen. on your monitor? OK, that's, uh, that's encouraging. Before, when I tried at the beginning of the session, as you may have no noted, I tried that, um, that uh, show, share desktop, and it didn't share it out for whatever reason. Yeah, it was sharing fine, and then you changed models, mm -hmm. and then it kicked out of screen sharing. Oh, interesting. Some interesting interaction there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it's an illustration of, of, of how they can be used together. Um, I have a lecture which I actually uh, gave just recently where I, it's an informal lecture, sort of tutorial on how this model works. So for anyone who's interested, you're welcome to check it out. It's currently on the class web page under the tutorial section. But are there any questions on these two sorts of modeling and how they relate to one another or how they could relate? So again, the choice here is, is one that's a matter of convenience. Um, we could encode everything that goes on in the upper part of the screen, all the resource requirements, the requirements for, um, for process, the whole process of, of uh, flowing through the system. We could encode that at the agent-based level. It's just the language that we saw associated with agent-based modeling, associated with events, and state charts and socks and flows, it's, it's less convenient to describe this sort of logic. So it's kind of nice to be able to have some of each. A further thing I want to emphasize that so will lead, lead into our next lecture is that all this sort of logic you see up here at the top of the screen, which we normally associate with the main class, main phase one, two, and three, a 
associated here with the main class, all of that could be associated within an agent. So if you had an agent who needed to, um, uh, to be associated with um, individuals within it, maybe it's a company, and these are processes of workflow associated with a company, maybe processes to approve uh, insurance applicants for an insurance provider. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's an organization that is a city, and maybe these are processes associated with um, a municipal, uh, municipal works or associated with um, the processing of individuals within that city. Maybe it's a hospital that's, that is constituted at the agent level, and these, uh, this represents the flow of patients within that hospital. We can have that within any logic. Moreover, what we're going to see next time is that we can have hierarchical models. So models where we can have an agent that represents, say, a city or a hospital, and then we can have agents within it that represent individual people. So we might have people, we might have neighborhoods, we might have cities, and we might have provinces, and we might have countries. And within each, there's a hierarchy of agents at different levels, and where each of those levels might have certain processes associated with it that are unique to that level, as well as collections of individuals from lower levels. Okay? So we'll see how that plays out next time it is somewhat germane to this issue of being able to embed this sort of um, network within a given agent. Suffice it to say that in any logic, it is very straightforward to do that. You could simply copy this entire flow into the definition of an agent, and then that agent would have those processes operating at the individual level. So again, this is a model that straddles the line between processes within a population and processes within a facility in a way that can be very powerful. So those are all my combinations for now. I think I'm going to ask um, uh, Tyson to see if he could interact a little bit more with this thing to see if we could figure out anything about why screen sharing is working in such a such a um, uh, erratic fashion. Very good. Thanks. And uh, I have office hours uh, starting now uh, for anyone who'd like to meet with me. We could start to meet right here, just so I'm nearby with Tyson and everything, and then we can go to my office as required, okay? So Tyson, you think there's, there's actually some interaction with uh